Okay, let's talk about some other elements of Hill Street Blues. Uh, one of them being uh, the 7 a.m. roll call. 7 a.m. roll. Well, sometimes it was 7 a.m., sometimes it was 6.53. We changed it constantly. Um, we decided almost instantly that, that, that Hill Street would encompass one day. Uh, and that was a really organizing uh, a, a format for us. And so we knew we want to start every episode with roll call, which was usually anywhere from 6.45 a.m. to 7.02 a.m., whatever it is. And then we'd go through the day to the end of the day, and that was the episode. And we could do that because w once we sort of released ourselves from the, from the necessity of having to close off every story, you know, you could just get these stories up on their feet and, and they'd go for two, three, four, six episodes till they resolved in their own natural uh, time. That was very groundbreaking at the time. Was there a problem at all with the network in terms of not closing off all the stories? Um... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think there was, um, and in fact, we modified the show in its second season. I mean, because I, I in, in the first year, I don't think we we ever resolved anything in a single episode, anything, and so you were always kind of left hanging. Um, and and one of the changes we made, starting with our second season, is, is you know, we resolved to tell one story that had a beginning and middle and end. So that even though we had 19 other things going on, uh, and strings dangling and going, you know, that at least if you just dropped in for an hour of Hill Street, you were going to get one story that had a beginning, a, a complicating middle, and a resolution. Now, when you were doing the story arcs, did you, before, would you um, know the conclusion of that arc before you started filming no, no. We, I, I, we, I, I've been asked that many times. I wish I could tell you that uh, we were more organized than we were. I wish I could tell you that at the beginning of the year we said, you know, here's this arc and it's going to go this long. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. I mean, we'd get a premise and we would just go with it. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a real high wire act. We didn't have much of a net un underneath us. And... I did something in the, s in the second season of Hill Street Blues, which, which I'd never done before and which was unheard of. I shut my company down because I didn't like the material that I had. I thought it wasn't good enough, and I shut the company down. You know, management went berserk. You know how much money this is costing? I said, do you know how much money it's going to cost you to make an episode that, you, that, that stinks? You know, you're spending a million dollars or whatever the hell it was to make an episode of television that's second rate as opposed to let's shut the company down for three days, you know, and spend $60,000 in lost time and get it right. And we did. That son of a gun. <laughs> you know, it worked. We wound up with a great script when we had started with something that was really mediocre. And what I discovered was, we can do that. And in fact, once I realized we could do that, we began to program into our schedule those damage control periods of time where, where we knew we were going to shut the company down for X number of days in the course of a season. We didn't know where it would come, but we budgeted it. What we became so expert at on Hill Street was anticipating problems so that when they came, we were prepared. Uh, another thing that, that the show did was uh, there were blackouts before commercial breaks. Yes. Uh, what we felt that that the drama in Hill Street was often so intense that that to just slam right from 
an act ending scene hard into a, a, a beer commercial was just too emotionally uh, 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 dishonest. And, and uh, we're not naive. We, we know we exist in a commercial environment and, and that what we're doing is, is a vehicle for delivering eyeballs to an advertiser. Uh, that said, what we asked for and got from the network because we took it out of our own program time. In other words, we weren't asking them to give us any extra time, but we took, oh, I don't know, it wasn't really very much time. It was X number of frames, less than a second, maybe a second, I don't know, uh, to just go to black and then go into the commercial. So that, so that even if it was subliminal, there, there was just a little moment where you could breathe again and then do your commercial stuff and then come back. Did you have any contact with the advertisers? No. No, we, no, uh, you know, the advertisers uh, uh, bought time from the networks. Uh, and that was the network's business, literally. That was their business, selling time uh, and selling advertising uh, uh, minutes. And we didn't have anything to do with that. I, re I remember because I was very young, certainly young in, in terms of the business, uh, that end of it, because writers and producers had never been allowed to access that part of the broadcast industry. I remember being told somewhere in, in the, I think it was in the first season of, of Hill Street that notwithstanding its very low ratings, that we were selling time to American Express, we were selling time to, you know, real, uh, uh, you know, banks, uh, a lot of high-end advertisers, because the audience we did have, even though it was small, was so desirable in terms of income. And it was the first time I'd ever even heard the concept of, of, of you know, demographics or, you know, desirable segment of the viewing audience, you know, who thought about stuff like that? That was their business. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that I think Fred Silverman loved us and was loyal to us and had a lot of guts in sticking with us, I think part of the reason was that the sales department was saying, you know what, we're attracting a level of, 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 of advertiser here that, that's telling us something about the show. Did things change at all when Brent Tinker assumed the presidency of NBC? Uh, yeah, everything changed. Uh, I mean, Hill Street was Hill Street. That never changed. Uh, and cer certainly my relationship with NBC was only enhanced by, by, by virtue of Grant going over there. And, and the success that he had, you know, empowered everybody there, and in turn, you know, me, uh, you know, which was most evident then really when, when we developed L.A. Law. Um, the real changes were, were, were the changes that, that occurred at MTM in the vacuum of his absence. Um, that was just a very, you know, uh, Grant was a very unique guy and he created a very unique environment. Uh, it was a joy to go to work for that guy every day. Um, I've tried to model my company after the way Grant ran his company because it was a place that you wanted to come to work every day. Uh, and that just changed when he left became a different environment. Uh, it became a, a much more negative environment. Not, n not as encouraging, you know, and nurturing. Uh, became much more, you know, business-oriented, bottom-line-oriented. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't without going into all that nasty stuff. They didn't much care for me 
and I didn't much care for them. Uh, and so when they fired me, you know, it, it came as no surprise. It was, it was pretty much of an inevitable uh, thing. I'd like to talk about that a little, a little later, um, but I would like to talk about the elements of the program first. Okay, I'm not um, sure I'm going to tell you very much. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, the theme song of Hill Street Blues. The music for Hill Street Blues was, was uh, you know, I remember saying to Mike Post, um, Because Greg had gone to Chicago and shot this remarkable footage that that he cut together in, into this fabulous montage of, of you know the cop car and the garage door going up and you know it was so evocative uh, and I, I said to Mike I said I, I don't know what the music for this thing should be except that, I, that, I, that I, I feel it should absolutely uh, uh, counter the visual. Uh, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't support the vis visual, it should contradict it. Because I think it, that'll make a real statement about what we're doing here. And I said I can't be more specific within that, except that I don't want us to have a, a theme that is typical of any cop show ever. And I said, I said to see these cars skidding around corners and stuff. I, I said to me, the music should be absolutely antithetical to the visual. And and part of Mike's genius, I think, is in translating my non-musical uh, uh, input into musical terms. And literally, I guess it's like with everything else in this show, it just something hit a hit a, a chord with him and he called me not much long, you know more than four or five days later and, and his studio was just a couple of blocks away from um, it's actually in the back of his house at that time you know he lived half a mile from from MTN he said you know come on over here I think I got something I want I want to play something for you so I went over there and he sat down at his piano and he played the Hill Street Blues theme. That was it. And then he wanted to muck it up with more orchestration stuff, and I kept saying, no, just the piano. That's all I want to hear. I mean, it's just such a, an, a, an extraordinary and evocative piece of music. Let's talk about some of the, the, the cast members and how they were cast, and maybe a little bit about their characters. Um, Daniel J. Trevante is Frank Ferrella. Daniel J. Travanti was the first actor we saw for the for the part, and you know, fifty actors later we hired him because we didn't ever see anybody who 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 just captured it the way he did. When you say it, what do you mean? It, whatever, whatever it is. There was first of all, he you know he was handsome with a, without being pretty. He was the right age. He he had a, a wonderful sort of. He had he for me he he really embodied in his acting. Much more so than in life, but in his acting he embodied what the essence of that character was, which was the calm center of a storm. He was the eye of the storm, uh, and he just. He had that 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 literal. He, he wouldn't blink. It was a really weird thing, you know. Trevante could sort of do a scene, and and when you were doing his coverage, the camera would be on him. He'd say, this guy's not blinking. I mean, it was so focused. You know, there was something great about that. Uh, he was a wonderful actor. Is a wonderful actor, and. Uh, While he wasn't funny, per se, God knows we didn't need funny, we had a lot of funny, he was so reactive, he was so wonderfully reactive and, and always kind of bemused at, at the madness going on around him. And, you know, he was a perfect guy for it. Perfect guy for it. Veronica Hamill was Joyce Davenport? She was the last one. We had, I think we'd actually, we'd either 
already started shooting. I think we had already started shooting when we hired her. Or we were like a day from shooting. Uh, I think we'd actually started. And we were desperate. We didn't, you know, we didn't have that, that actress yet. And uh, I remember we were playing wiffle ball in the hall at lunchtime one day. And, and down the hall comes this exquisite woman. And somebody said, oh, that's Veronica Hamill. And she said, who's Veronica Hamill? Oh, she's coming in to read for, you know, Dale. I said, oh. And I looked and I thought, oh, gosh. Please, please be good. Please be good. And she was. She was great. Barbara Boston is Faye Farilla. Barbara Boston is Faye Farilla. Uh, that role started out really as, as a small role in, in the pilot. Um, that was not a series regular. You know, it was just, it was a character that was designed to uh, contextualize Frank Frillo. And I thought Barbara would be great in that role. And on screen, you know, <laughs> they were terrific together. And I, I was told that Fred Silverman, when he saw the pilot, said, that woman, she's going to be a regular, right? Because he, I think he, he really enjoyed that, uh, you know, that byplay between them. So I thought, well, you know, maybe we can make a deal with her. You were married to her at the time. Yeah. Um, Michael Conrad, Sergeant Estrahas. Michael Conrad and I had remained friends ever since Del Vecchio. Um, and he, I, I, I think Kozel and I saw him in that role almost from the day we wrote it. it was, you know, we saw a lot of people uh, almost from the very beginning. And, and, you know, didn't really need to read 30 people. Uh, we wanted Michael. I thought he'd be great, and he was. Uh, Keel Martin, who I'd been looking to work with again. Mike Warren, who'd been in Paris. Charlie, who'd been in Del Vecchio. Um, Bruce. Bruce had to come in and read because I, Grant didn't believe that Bruce could do that role. And Bruce got himself up as Belker or his vision of Belker and in walked into my office this ugh, this horrible creature, you know, looked like he sort of emerged out from under a bridge somewhere, you know. <laughs> he read, he he read the, the pages, and he leapt on the desk, and he started growling at Grant. Scared the shit out of Grant, you know. And and so then he leaves. He stormed out of the room, you know. And I looked at Grant, and he said, "Well, I'm not going to be the one to tell him he can't have the job." And he got up and left. Uh, Betty Thomas is Lucy Bates. Same thing as Barbara. Betty, along with Joe Spano, uh, w was hired just to be a, you know, a very small, sort of a peripheral character. Um, and they were just so wonderful in the pilot. They had so, so much uh, energy and so much specificity that, that, that when we saw them in the environment, we thought, oh, God, how can you not have those people? In the, in, in the environment. So we made them right. You know, we wound up making uh, Joe, Betty, Barbara. We instantly made them regulars, um, along with our original group of seven or whatever it was. And then by the end of the first season, we had added uh, Eddie Marinow. We had 11 or 12 regulars by the end of the first season. Now, as, as, as time went on and the series became popular, was, uh, how did the notoriety affect these actors? Did it affect the show at all? Yeah, you know, it always does. Uh, I mean, it's a real thing, notoriety, success. This was not just a show becoming successful, which has its own energy to it anyway. But this was a phenomenon. This is a show that suddenly a 
became iconic. People went nuts over it. And, and, and so these actors, everywhere they went, suddenly were stars of a certain magnitude. Uh, it was pretty heady. It's pretty heady. And, uh, you know, some of them were capable of being serious jerks. Serious jerks. A lot of them were capable of being serious jerks and were. But, you know, you deal with it. Talk a little bit about the storylines um, and some of the main uh, the story points. Uh, the first being in the pilot, how Renko and Hill were shot, the uh, pilot of the, of the series. Yeah, we, you know, we just thought that would be really good storytelling. Um, and uh, when we hired Charlie to be Renko, we had to hire him in second position because he had done a half-hour pilot. I think it was actually a medical pilot. And uh, so I thought, that's all right, because Mike and I wanted to do something really dramatic and kill one of these guys just to show, you know, you know the reality of that life and how suddenly it, the, just the sort of normal day-to-day -day stuff of being a cop can can spin out of control, and before you know it, somebody you know you know some horrible horrible tragedy occurs, which is the reality the cops have to live with the potential for that kind of danger every day of their lives. So, uh, but we figured you know Charlie's going to do this other thing anyway, so we'll just kill him off, let him die, which is how we made the, the pilot. And then, of course, the day after the schedules were announced, and Charlie showed it and make it, he called me, Oh, I got the in the show. You know, so, <laughs> so we, we changed it. When we went back to work, we, we, you know, we, we changed the ending so that, so that he didn't die. Which, and what, what was great about it is that then, again, because of... of Hill Street's uh, uh, world of consequence where, you know, five seconds of violence creates a lifetime of consequence, which is really what I felt we were legitimately supposed to be about. Uh, we, we were able to make good on that thematic promise instantly. Because now we, you know, when we when we started our regular season after the pilot, we had two cops coming back to active duty after recovering, physically at least, recovering from life-threatening wounds, and we were able to track the emotional uh, uh, consequences of, of that singular moment over weeks of storytelling. It was great, and that really, for me set the template for how, how we do this show. Another story point was the clandestine relationship between Frank Furillo and Joyce Davenport. How important was that to the series? Well, it was a great romance between Furillo and Davenport, you know. Uh, and, I, and I loved the way we, we, we set up their adversarial relationship before revealing at the very end of that first episode that they were lovers. I mean, it was great. It, it, you know, it's, it, it, Davenport Ferrillo at the back end of the show was as much a signature of Hill Street Blues as the roll call was at, at, at the front. And, and, and it, had a, it had a fabulous sort of balance to it, you know, because the raucous beginning evolving inevitably into the small, intimate ending of every episode. Just it had a symmetry for me that I loved. Um, in the series, uh, Sergeant Hesterhaus uh, died with the death of Michael Conrad. In season four, yeah. yeah. How was that handled? Um, it was handled beautifully. <laughs> Um, you know, we knew Michael was dying. 
It was really extraordinary. He had cancer. He was failing. He wanted to come to work every day. He didn't want to miss a day of work. And he didn't. We couldn't insure him, obviously, and so we didn't. We just took our chances. Uh, we picked him up at the hospital, brought him to work, and go back to the hospital at night when he was done with work. We made him hair pieces, you know, and fall on because he lost everything to chemotherapy. Um, And then he went into a, a bit of a remission, you know, where we had a, a nice little period of time there. With him. And then, you know, it was just a, a holding action. And, and, and we lost him. And we knew, we, we knew that was going to happen. So, uh, I don't think consciously I thought too much about how I wanted to resolve that issue. The one thing that we did sort of talk about was that he should he should die in the saddle, as it were. That he should, that in the show he should die, you know, making love to to Grace Gardner, and uh, we did that. So we knew we would do that. But the thing that came to me spontaneously, but probably not, it probably had been cooking back there, was the idea of sweeping his ashes down into the sewers, you know, as a sort of a fitting way to send one of our guys off into the bowels of the city, you know, and, and that was pretty good. Greg directed that, as I recall, and it was really wonderful. What are some of your favorite storylines of the series? I can't remember. I swear to you, I, you know, in, th in five years, over a hundred hours, and probably five hundred stories plus, because you know there's so many storylines in every episode. I mean, I can't. I, who the hell can I, I? I can remember moments more than I can remember, you know, storylines. Uh, it's sort of frustrating, but there you have it. Is there one moment that you can pinpoint? Well, the one we just talked about probably is uh, seared in my memory. The other one is the la the very last scene of the opening episode of the third season, uh, which was David Milch's first script for us, called Trial by Fury, um, where Ferrillo goes into a confessional. Church. That was that was a remarkable moment for me. Um, I remember in the f uh, it was in the first season when we revealed that Frillo was an alcoholic. You know that was really extraordinary. That was a great moment. Great moment. Uh, I remember bits and pieces of Alfrey's Alfrey Woodard's performance. Uh, that she won an Emmy for. Uh, I think that was in the th third year. I think that was in the third year. She was extraordinary. You know, just stuff like that. Okay, let's stop here to change the tape. <laughs>